Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Cohen, the author of An Introduction to the Art and Science of Chinese Tea Ceremony. Today, we're discussing Book 2, Chapter 3, Section 3, Ming Dynasty Yixing History. Here to talk about this chapter is our editorial team, Patrick Penny. Yo. And Zongjun Li. Hello. Hello, Pat. Hello, Zongjun. My first question, what changes occurred in the Ming that spurred the development of Yixing teapots? Very generally, what you hear from everyone is the uh, switch, you know, as we go from Song and Yuan into the Ming, um, from things like, uh, well, wax tea in the Tang, powdered tea in the Song, um, you know, the Mongols coming along and kind of mixing things up, and then, uh, you know, Emperor Hongwu making his decree that wax tea was no longer to be consumed for taxing the people. Uh, and so we have a big switch to loose leaf tea, which, you know, is often overgeneralized in, in how widespread it is. Uh, and the lack of drinking loose leaf tea is pre-Ming is something that, you know, people always glaze over when they talk tea history. But a bigger shift towards drinking loose leaf tea is a, a major factor that I think starts to influence the wares that are utilized at the time. Yeah, and also, you know, the increasing popularity of, um, you know, teas from Hui Mountains and uh, Chaozhou style of drinking tea um, start to gain its popularity during Ming Dynasty, and that heavily influenced people's habit of drinking tea later on. Right, to that, you have like the Song Luo method, right? So um, we start yeah. having different methods for uh, controlling degree of oxidation, uh, controlling stages like withering more. Um, and just having finer control over the tea processing uh, than we see pre-Ming. Uh, so we start to really see differentiation in styles of tea, uh, which obviously would lead to more, more wares to, you know, enjoy and express those types of tea. What role did the Ming government have in the development of the ceramics industry? Oh, a lot of um, active participation in, you know, holding up and construct uh, official kiln. So all of the uh, official combs and official imperial style commissions were heavily built, you know, during those eras, and also cast cascadingly heavily, um, you know, influenced how, you know, civil combs or civil style of drinking tea or firing, you know, wares uh, later on in the dynasty. But Yixing was never an imperial kiln, and it was never an imperial kiln center. So how did the government wind up supporting Yixing, or did it support Yixing? I think um, as you see competition, right, so whether that's private kilns that are making uh, new wares for, you know, the imperial house or, or the imperial kilns themselves, um, you know, Yixing as a ceramic center still sees those, is influenced by them, and of course sees the market, right, that they want to capture. Um, so they're going to be, you know, copying things that they're seeing in some of the most popular kilns like Junyao, Rudyao, or any of the other large wares at the time. And also, you got to mention about the uh, Guanda Mingshao system that happened in Ming Dynasty. So, you know, towards um, the later on, the more matured in, uh, part of the industry, um, you start to have uh, government to host official kilns, uh, but having, you know, civilians to be able to fire wares um, and utilize the system, you know, to create uh, wares for their own. And that also, you know, heavily influenced, uh, you know, how. Uh, private kilns and uh, official kilns and its collaboration and later on, you know, of the fusion of their, of both aesthetics. And towards the end of the Ming, the private kilns that were supported with the Guanda Minchao system actually outcompeted many of the imperial kilns. They fell into to disrepair before their, their reemergence uh, in the Qing. What traditions and innovations of the Ming survive to today? Many of the, uh, you know, color and glaze schemes uh, we still see, you know, survive through the Qing and up until this day. So not specific to Yixing, but overglaze techniques and underglaze techniques like uh, Duozai, Fensai, um, you know, some different uh, monochrome and polychrome color systems, specific glazing uh, schema that some, some did make it, some die off in the Ming and are revitalized in the Qing. Um, but, you know, many of those wares are still really popular today. Like Jason, you mentioned in previous chapter, I think of the first book and in, in previous podcasts, we talked about the ox blood red color, which, you know, um, had probably some influence originally from Europeans. And I think when there's influence from Europe, China kind of takes all of these glazes to the next level, which is what we see, I think in that case, 
But yeah, a lot of demand, uh, not even just in China, but outside of China that influences glazing, which I think we see some of those techniques to this day. Yeah, absolutely. Um, glazing had been a very important part of, you know, uh, ceramics uh, that really started from Ming Dynasty as a practice. And also later on, um, after uh, a lot of the Western influence, you start to seeing regular Karak pattern that used to be only happened in uh, plate format, but also later on got adopted into some of the tea wares too. So those things affected tea and tea wares, but is there any traditions within tea that we continue to practice from the Ming? Broadly speaking, uh, you know, we see Chaozhou Gongfu develop uh, throughout the Ming Dynasty towards the later end of it, where as Yixing wares are becoming more popular and as the um, production techniques that we've discussed earlier start to differentiate styles of tea, um, we see, you know, higher and higher quality teas being made um, that are unique and from special areas and uh, a lot of, you know, like cha ren, right, people who are really interested in tea are going out and going to the, you know, highest lengths to prepare these teas in a special and dedicated format. And so we're seeing um, the size of Yixing's shrinking over the Ming Dynasty. And towards the end of the Ming, we're starting to see something more similar to what we practice today as far as uh, small teapot brewing methods, um, you know, with a, a large focus on the quality of the, the teapot, the cups, and the teaware itself. The dominance of Yixing was not inevitable. Which of the competing kiln sites and ceramic traditions remain active and preferred today? And which of them continue to offer competition? I would definitely say, um, you know, Chaozhou Gongfu and um, its associated tea wear style is definitely a pretty, uh, uh, maybe not, you know, super wide, but definitely very regionally strong competition to Yixing. It's of its own world, uh, different techniques, uh, different clay materials but it turns out to have very uh, interesting and towards some degrees, very similar effect towards tea. But, you know, as people start to use them to brew a uh, different kind of tea that's outside of traditional, um, you know, Feng Huang Danchong style tea. I, I don't feel like I actually see a ton of people using, you know, Chaozhou clay, like the Shanto clay teapots. Uh, and that's something that might be interesting as we see people kind of stashing F1s where they can find them and, uh, going after, you know, Qing Dynasty Yixings. Um, I'm wondering when we're going to start seeing people move towards antique Shanto and the like, because um, not, not that they're readily available, but it doesn't feel like the Western market has really latched yeah. onto them. Um, but si similarly, like to what you said, right, there's there's the Chaozhou clay um, teapots, but there's also things like Jian Shui, right, from Yunnan, uh, which I do think I've seen some popularity in the West because many of our, you know, Western tea vendors uh, are really focused on Yunnan, right, and Puartis. Uh, so we have seen a lot of Jian Shui make it into the market. Yeah, well, Chaozhou tea bar works great with white tea. Uh, that's my personal experience. So you feel free uh, you to know, try No, I never thought to try it. Yeah, I never thought to try that. I'll have to give it a go. In case anyone is uh, holiday shopping, I have been deeply desirous of a De Hua teapot. I do believe that that continues to uh, offer competition to Yixin. For different reasons, but uh, as long does as it have to be, does it have to be an antique, Jason? Antique, preferably shipwrecked, okay. uh, but definitely of antique. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I mean, the, the nice thing is, uh, you know, Qing Dynasty Da Hua, like late Qing, is not impossible to find and is not crazy expensive if it's not a, you know, specifically imperial wear. So I don't know that we want to tip people off to that through our podcast, but because it might become expensive in the West. And we swung the market. There, <laughs> there went the Sotheby's auction. <laughs> but de um, definitely agreed. I, I'm always searching out, uh, seeking out Dahua cups because um, I personally love the effect on you know, oolong tea. So uh, I've only got one antique Dahua cup right now, but keeping my eyes out. Agreed. Also works great with wine. Yeah, definitely. That might make an appearance in the in the book. <laughs> What's the Stay relationship sure. between kettles and teapots? Is Zisha really a good material for kettles? And if so, why don't we commonly see Zisha kettles? Well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that we don't commonly see Zisha kettles. Um, I think in our practice and with a lot of the people that we interact with, um, it's not highly popular. Uh, a lot of 
I think people who have studied uh, maybe more Taiwan-based tea lineages, you know, have moved to Tetsubin um, as kind of our preferred method of boiling water. But I, I think uh, when you look at groups like Global Tea Hut, right, boiling in clay, be that Zusho or, um, you know, wild clay of some sort, still seems to be very popular with that group. Well, back in the days, you frequently will see, um, you know, people using um, lower grade zini or sometimes jiani to, you know, make uh, daily wares like kettles or, you know, pots or kitchen wares. But when you start to use more refined um, and high, higher grade uh, zisha to make teapots, um, it's frequently not as durable um, as other materials. You know, placing a zisha made teapot directly on top of a fire, um, it's not usually a good idea, especially when adding cold water into it. So I think that's one of the reasons why we don't very frequently see um, a zisha kettle being used in daily basis. Yeah, I think uh, Tetsubin, right? You you really have to mess up to break a Tetsubin. Um, it <laughs> takes quite a lot of effort, right? Like, I mean, it's still being heated up, right? But just its its resistance to um, any kind of heat shock is much stronger than that of clay. Uh, and so I think that that is definitely a factor. I think when you're buying an expensive uh, teaware, like a kettle, to put, you know, five or $600 down on a Tetsubin that you know is going to be more sturdy versus a similarly priced Zosha or various other, you know, forms of clay kettle, you just know you're going to probably have a Tetsubin for life, whereas those clay kettles, anything can happen. Yep. Although you do see um, Chaozhou clay being frequently used to make into a hard kettle quite frequently. It's also a very important component of uh, Chaozhou Kung Fu, you know, hot kettle paired with a Nilu, and then, you know, you have the best water for that. So. Well, speaking of that, this chapter mentions the rarely discussed Chuanshin Dao, the hearted kettle. Pat, can you describe the kettle and explain its use? Never been so afraid to hold the kettle in my life. <laughs> uh, so it, it is a kettle that has literally something like a chimney in the middle. So as you put this kettle, which has the heart or this hollow space, uh, as, as I described, like a chimney in the middle, onto your Nilu, it's going to be heated up much more rapidly because there's heat not only coming from uh, the bottom where the nilu is and the charcoal, um, but it's able to work its way through the center of the pot, through this heart, hollow space, um, and heat basically all of the walls of the kettle. You know, when you are doing chao jiao gong fu and you are brewing a very small volume of tea with all of your focus, you know, having this kettle available to get up to temperature very quickly and to maintain temperature uh, you know, is, is pretty essential, I think, to, to do the practice at the highest level. Um, but it, it just felt so fragile holding this kettle um, that I, I was really, I mean, it, it felt amazing to pour from it. It felt really nice to use, but I was so concerned the whole time I was using it. I believe the one that we had handled was uh, Ching, right? Ching. Yes. Wow. So, I mean, just uh, there was a lot, lot of concern on my end using it. I very rarely felt that with any teaware. Um, but the, the performance was amazing. Um, obviously, we were using very high quality tea and very, all of the other wares were quite high quality. So it was very hard to isolate how much of an effect the Chuan Xin Dao had. But the entire experience, I mean, it, it, it adds not just to the taste, obviously, the tea, but the phenomenology all around. Absolutely. Is it, is it superior? Uh, why is it so rare? Why haven't we ever seen one outside of the Institute, right? If, if we believe that this thing is good, uh, why hasn't the broader tea community picked up on it? First, I'm a scientist. So I don't know if it's superior. Uh, we did not do, you know, rigorous experimentation, uh, that versus other kettles. As I said, you know, the, the experience was amazing. We, we didn't use it very frequently just because of how delicate and how rare of an antique it was. Uh, so that, that's part of why I would hesitate to say it definitely was superior. But I would say the reason we don't see it very frequently is it was probably hard as hell to make. Uh, I don't imagine that a lot of people know how to make, you know, a, a hearted kettle, right? A kettle with a hollow space in the middle. Throwing that, right? Hand building it, whatever was done for it. I think it was hand built. Um, had to have been such a laborious task that could have only been done by quite a skilled craftsman. I don't imagine there's a lot of people that were able to make those. And I don't imagine the skill was passed down for long. Yeah, so absolutely agree. I recently acquired one from Chao Zhou through a friend. And uh, God, that thing is like delicate. It's like an eggshell. Um, <laughs> I cannot imagine that will travel well. 
um, all the way from you know <laughs> a remote village in Guangdong to to the states. It still sits in my uh, my 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 tea decks in Shanghai. Uh, didn't bother to even bring it all the way to here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would I wouldn't bother to pack that thing. But just you know, yeah. I think with a wear like that, as you mentioned, it's so so fragile. You really have to be using all of your focus, right? When you put it back down on the Nilu, um, that that is a wear that demands your attention to such a high level that it you know it does make it really perfect for uh, serious chaozhou kung fu cha. Yixing is widely known for being made and signed by a single artist. Why was Yixing the art form that fostered individualism? Jason, can you elaborate your question a little bit? So when we think about art from the uh, imperial kilns, they bear the rain mark, usually, uh, of the emperor. Uh, sometimes they'll bear marks sim simply saying tribute. Uh, but they don't bear the inscription or the art of an individual craftsman. When we look at the majority of arts, uh, ceramic arts across China, um, from the Xuan kilns or from the Duhua kilns, none of them contain the the chop or the, the inscription of a single individual. It really was Yixing that was at the forefront of an individual artist making an individual piece and signing the work. Why, why Yixing? Why Yixing of all the arts did that uh, foster that 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 type of culture of individualism? That's an interesting question. A lot of the famous Yixing makers and especially Yixing wares itself is highly tied to the literati community in China. When you have a group of well-known uh, literati and scholars drinking tea on a daily basis, um, you start to seeing, you know, uh, pursuit or appreciation of certain style of uh, Yixing teapots or certain aesthetics of Yixing teapots flowing around in the community. Um, so later on, you start to, you know, not even, um, I, I don't think that the trend was even started from, you know, sealing or chopping an uh, artist's name on the teapot. You start to see first, see people talk about the shape of the teapot coined by a certain artist, uh, like a Mengchen shape or a, a, a Da Bing shaped teapot. And I think that was um, the first spark of in individualism and also, you know, people's brand um, that's tied to a certain style of Yixing uh, or, or a tea wear um, to begin with. I, I like where you took that and I'll take it just uh, one step further with, you know, it's, it's not uh, unusual in the literary circles to see, of course, uh, a beautiful painting that is signed by the artist, right? It's not unusual for a poem uh, to be signed uh, you know, handwritten calligraphy poem. Uh, and so I think, as you were saying, right, with uh, a wear that's so appreciated by the literati, uh, why would it be strange for a teapot to have a signature as well? Um, so I, I think because of the way that the literati uh, influenced teaware, uh, the way that, you know, teaware makers were, of course, uh, to a road influenced by the literati, I think there would have been, you know, some push probably from the people commissioning these teapots to have, uh, you know, a real record that this was made by this person. And there, there's no better record than carving it right into the clay. And, you know, tea pots were a medium also for a lot of these appreciated artistic pursuits like poetry uh, and like painting. You see teapots with, you know, many of these very popular uh, Chinese motifs uh, either inscribed or in some cases overglazed painted onto them. Are there counter examples? where a Yixing was not uh, a singular work, where Yixing was uh, a shared work or was left unsigned? Yeah, certainly. I mean, you have, you have uh, you know, our artistic, I don't want to call them kilns, that's what they are, but there's uh, like studios, right? Um, where you would have a, a master who's maybe finishing the pots off, but you'd have apprentices who are trying to learn their style and would be building pots within their style and the master probably in a lot of cases would come over and just fix what little flaws he sees without saying much. But certainly there, there were studios, right, that would be building these. So it's not always like, uh, you know, it was just Gongchun or, you know, Shadabin that built every single pot they ever made and never taught anyone and never worked with anyone else. Um, so that, that's certainly not the case. But, you know, as we move into uh, the modern age, right, factory built Yixing obviously becomes uh, a huge focus. And I know you're going to talk about that more as we move forward, but uh, it's not to say it never happened in, uh, you know, older times as well. One, one counter example I would like to point out is we frequently talk about the chops and the signatures on the teapots as if they were always the artist. 
and they certainly were for the most famous of the artists. But when there was a commissioning scholar who wanted his job on his design of teapots, right, he wasn't usually getting his hands full of clay. And so there is a counterexample where these were the ideas of individuals executed by craftsmen. And it's actually an important note that this is part of what started uh, the trend of the scholars and craftsmen working side by side and, and learning from each other and beginning to appreciate each other's skills. And we all uh, have pots of that example where, I mean, Jason, you've commissioned a Yixing and it's got your chop on the bottom. It does. And I've tried to make ceramic before, Pat. You and I sat there in Korea. You made a beautiful Ongi elephant teapot. Uh, that, that is beautiful. That's my one masterpiece and I'll stop there. <laughs> I, I have uh, one or two cups made by you and um, I don't use them a lot, but I, I cherish them. They might not be beautiful, but they, you build them. <laughs> this, this, teapot, this, this teapot certainly uh, far exceeds anything you ever made and that's okay. It's got your chop on the bottom. <laughs> It, it it is my design <laughs> well continuing this idea of art artistry and using the yixing teapot as a canvas inscriptions were super popular in the ming uh and into the Qing. why don't we see the same level of popularity today we we do we still do see a lot of them so i think um you know heart suture teapots are very popular uh, yeah, with the western teapot. community uh, yeah, just because I think, you know, we've got, you've got groups like Global Tea Hut who are really like heart suture pots. Um, uh, additionally, the drink oolong tea teapots from kind of the uh, ROC period um, and obviously continue to be made till today. Um, I, I still see those around a lot, actually, pretty frequently, even in, in tea houses selling pretty crappy teapots. You still see a lot of those. Yeah, and also in the communist era, you have the reserve for leader teapot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, or commemorate teapots, you know, uh, with the inscription on top. Well, do you have a preference for calligraphy or line paintings? Because beyond the Heart Sutra, we don't see a lot of high-level practitioners using highly ordained yishings. So if we think that the, there are good examples, uh, do you have a preference between the types uh, for either calligraphy or line paintings or both? Well... My preference is, obvi is obvious through what I purchase. I, I own no Yixings with any kind of decorative uh, design, inscription, anything like that. So um, I guess my purchases speak for my preference. I would like to own one. I just, you know, I guess I, it's it's anytime I get down to purchasing, I, I choose the more simple product. Yeah, I do appreciate simple designs, but also I pretty like, you know, um, some of the chipped Yixing, but it was Kintsuki or used the Chinese, uh, the stable Ju technique um, to, to fix. Um, sometimes, you know, the, the staples will uh, have some sort of decorations, you know, like a small cherry blossom or, you know, a small, you know, little cloud or fish. Uh, those are, I think, of, of my personal appreciation. Oh dear, we're going to start seeing the Kintsugi Yixing Club. This is <laughs> oh, it already exists, direction. dude. It already exists. I, I, you don't, you don't go on Discord. <laughs> we're we're nearing the end, but if you were to inscribe a Yixing, what visual or what inscription would you add? I, I would probably put just something. Uh, as I said, I don't own anything inscribed. So I really would be basic, like I would go pretty simple for gentlemen or something like that, right? Um, so I'd have maybe, you know, some bamboo or plum. Uh, yeah, not sure exactly. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, not sure exactly what I would go for, you know, or maybe even a small, small landscape painting of some sort. Nothing, nothing too epic. I'm sure, you know, uh, some, some vendors would do something way more interesting than what I would do. Just going to say pincha under the spout. Yeah, that's about it. You know, no, no uh, supreme logo carved into it or anything like that. I would definitely inscribe a big star <laughs> on top of my lid. <laughs> Jason, what would yours be? It's a difficult question. I've been thinking about this. We're commissioning Yixings. Don't we have to do an inscribed Yixing? Picasso's Guernica just around the entire thing. Guernica. Guernica could work. Uh, I was thinking something a little more Abex, uh, maybe a Rothko, but it's, uh, 
hard to do without mixed clay. I was thinking maybe we do one of those coated yixings. Yeah, well, or we can totally adopt, you know, the Sai Twombly style. Drawing ah. swirly circles around the yixing, you know. Jason, we, we know how much you love Warhol. I think we need to do a Warhol yixing. Well, I like Sai Twombly even more. Nothing, nothing has ever spoken to me more than seeing his uh, scribbles next to ancient masterpieces at the Louvre. Uh, Abu Dhabi. That was a moment that made me close my you, eyes. You look so happy about <laughs> it. For, cl for clarity, this is going to go in errata. I do not like Sai Tombly. <laughs> <laughs> but if there was ever an artist I could recreate, I'll do my own drawings, my own inscriptions on the Yixing. I can do it. I have the hand-eye coordination for this one. I'm glad an elephant on the again. Same page. <laughs> my Second to last question, my penultimate question. Why was there a divergence in the size of Yixing teapots and teapots generally uh, during the Ming? Some stayed large, some became rapidly smaller. What, what was the cause of that divergence? Well, you, you maintain more than one practice of consuming tea. And so uh, while um, there would be, you know, the, the scholar literati that would be potentially focusing on um, more of a style along the lines of Gong Fu Cha, right? So very high quality tea and trying to brew it in a very purposeful way with a small group of people who are passionate about it. Um, you also still had things like, uh, you know, literati gatherings where there would be, um, you know, a large pot of tea being made and people would be focusing on something that is not just the tea. Um, so poetry would be composed or paintings would be made. Um, and that... Yeah, at, at that point, um, you know, you're not going to break out your finest teaware for this potentially large group while they're doing something else, right? It's the way we still consume tea today. If you're with a big group of people who still like tea, um, you're, you're not going to break out your finest and smallest wares for us to be doing something different. If we're not just drinking tea, then you don't want to be doing, uh, you know, a very dedicated Gong Fu session. And that, that's why I believe that we still see, you know, such a variety of uh, tea wares in the Ming in size, uh, and, and of course we still do today. Absolutely, especially you know those activities will follow heavy drinking usually afterwards. <laughs> That's uh, where we see the most uh, beautiful you know calligraphies or paintings being created. <laughs> Sometimes there's heavy drinking before, right? And you're you're not going to oh, yeah. take your finest wares uh, after you've had you know a lot of nice wine. That's when you ask your servants to brew the tea. <laughs> as we so see well. in many paintings, right? My final question. Songjun, you're a huge fan of the Wanli Emperor. Why is he your second favorite? That's a very hard question to answer. Well, Wanli is, himself is a very complex emperor. Um, he very much as resembles the style of uh, Xuanzong from Tang Dynasty, right? You have a very dedicated and um, ambitious emperor in early uh, you know, stage of his uh, his realm, but later on, you know, due due to some circumstances, and for Wan Li is the um, the very famous Zhong Guoben case, so which um, uh, the eunuch community was fighting over for to have uh, Wan Li's second son to be named as the prince. But Wan Li, I'm sorry, to to have the first son to be named as the prince. But Wan Li was personally in favor of the second son, um, so that created a huge fuss uh, in the middle stage of his realm, and later on led to a total, uh, you know, destruction of uh, personal dedication towards ruling the court from Wan Li's side. And of course, later on, you know, you have the three, um, you know, expedition uh, war to Korea and with the Japan. Uh, invasions, you know, later on in Wan Li's uh, realm, all of these, you know, created a very, very complex figure, and his style of ruling you know, heavily influenced um, you know, Chinese politics to today. Well, thank you everyone for joining us in this edition of Tea Technique Editorial Conversations. Please join us again for our next conversation, Qing Dynasty Yixing History. Mm -hmm.